Data mesh is a paradigm shift in big data management and analytical data management. It's really an answer to some of the shortcomings and challenges of the past paradigms in big data management, which were data warehousing, data lakes, data hubs, any variations in between, and really applies decentralized thinking or distributed architecture, product thinking, platform thinking, and a federated model of governance to big data to be able to scale managing data and being able to get actually value out of data at scale. As part of unlearning, one aspect of our conversation should be unlearning a language because we have this linguistic relativity that are the way we talk impacts the way we think and then the way we think impacts the way we design and then then impacts the language, right? So for years and years, we've used the word asset. Data is an asset, right? So when you say asset, then you want more of it. Then you want to keep it. You want to hide it. So it creates a very different like success metrics and so on. So then it leads to, I need more of my asset as opposed to if you use the language data as a product perhaps, or maybe a gift even better than that. The way to think differently is to act differently and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals into actionable strategies you can use to think big, start small, and learn fast, and find your edge with excellence. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Jamak Tagani, Director of Emerging Technologies at ThoughtWorks and creator of one of the most exciting paradigm shifts in how we manage data at scale, known as Data Mesh. Now, I've known Jamak for almost 10 years from when we worked together at ThoughtWorks, and what struck me instantly about her was the variety and depth of her technical experience. She's a bunch of patents, worked in hardware and software systems, pioneered microservice architectures, and now turned her attention towards data, and started a debate on how so much of our mindsets and methods towards data processing, management, and architecture must be unlearned. Yes, that single source of data project, that golden source to hold all our business secrets, isn't business intelligent, it's BS. Data platforms based on data lake architectures have common failure modes that lead to unfulfilled potential for data at scale. And to address these failure modes, we need to shift from centralized or lakes or even older school data warehouses, to a new paradigm of modern distributed architecture, apply platform thinking to create self-serving data infrastructure and treat data as a product. This show is for those who are curious to understand how to bring the convergence of product thinking, data management, and distributed systems development together to create platforms and products of the future. But before we dive into that, Let's understand some of the very early values and principles that have helped Chimac throughout her career and the patterns and shifts of paradigms to create some extraordinary products. One common thread is the value system that you're brought up in and the value system of whether it's in academic or whether it's your work. And one of those value systems, I guess, that were inherent in me or developed in me were around distribution of responsibility, centralization of ownership, all of those design patterns that are more real and compatible with real life than order or structure that we can sometimes want to enforce in life through our designs and it, they become quite fragile. And funny enough, I actually grew up in a very centralized kind of command and control authoritative government, I suppose, which is counter to to my belief system or value system. When I entered, I guess, Workspace 20 something years ago, I started working with fantastic engineers that I've actually come across crossing paths with them 20 something years later right now in my work in Data Mesh. But they taught me the Unix philosophy. They taught me, you know, those wonderful ideas to build systems and programs that do one thing and one thing really well. But most importantly, they work together really well. So building cooperative, distributed kind of designs and systems and work based on simplicity. Simple is beautiful and beauty is the truth. I think that was my like stolen tagline or my signature line for quite a while for my email. But find, you know, reduce systems to kind of their simple principles 
that then together, you know, can emerge complex behaviors. The other intrinsic, I guess, value or interest that I've always had was being curious about intersection of disciplines and creating some magic between the intersection of disciplines. I moved from software to distributed systems, from distributed systems to hardware, from hardware to consulting and enterprise architecture, and then to data. But in each of those transition moments, I brought, you know, an aspect of the discipline that I already knew and kind of overlaid that and adapt that to this new, you know, discipline. And at the intersection of, I think, those disciplines, some magic can happen. This summary, I think, moving to data was really, I saw an opportunity for bringing those basic Unix philosopher principles to data that for some reason we had disregarded you know, in the operational world in how we build distributed systems and microservices and all of that is founded in those principles. But for some reason, when it came to data, we decided that we're going to come up with a different set of first principles, that data is useful when it's collected and gathered and put in one place and it's been decoupled or separated from its soul, like (laughs) it's separated from the code. We kind of separated data from the code and to me, it's just analogous to like separating soul from the body. The moment you separate the soul, the body starts like decomposing. So the moment you separate the code that maintains that data and put it in some static or non-static, doesn't matter, in, in a repository of some sort, it's to start decaying, start becoming meaningless, you know, becoming kind of move away from its truth or the source of truth or originates it from so for some reason, we, we ignored the Unix philosophies and we just went down this path of centralization. So I, I, when I came to the world of data, I went, okay, there's an opportunity here. There's a struggle. There's a crisis. People are challenged. We're getting meaning and value out of it. So how can we apply those tens of years of learnings in an adjacent world, the operational world, to the world of data? It's always fascinating to me, the sort of eureka moments, or sometimes I call them these unlearning moments that we have and pattern matching, right? I think this is one thing I know, you know, I've seen you do from, you know, working and spending time with you and people who are natural sort of synthetic thinkers or see ideas or really understand first principles of of what they're aiming for and then start to go from a different domain to another can see patterns sometimes that the folks that are so uh, isolated or siloed in their viewpoint sort of miss. It can be, it's a trivial sometimes I find where I'm like, when you're a consultant and you go into a company and you just ask the question, why are we doing it this way? That seems odd. Have you ever thought of uh, this approach? Everyone suddenly goes, no, we haven't because we've been so focused or, you know, you bring a new employee along to a meeting who's never been stuck in the same conversation that goes round and round about what way we should we should try to solve this problem. And it's generally some graduate who goes, well, hang on, I, I, I've seen this problem in a totally different domain. And it creates these sort of breakthroughs, you know, and I think we get so comfortable with our classic behaviors, the things that we know, the things that feel comfortable to us. And, you know, I just see this yeah. pattern again and again, And yet, similarly, the sort of antidote pattern always seems to be people that take ideas from other domains that they've operated in and apply them, the principles or the first principles, you know, this idea of really small, very specific pieces of functionality that something does. And that's eloquent and amazing in itself. But when you combine all these very simple components to something bigger, it creates an ecosystem or and it creates a stronger system than ever one individual component could create, right? We see that sort of again and again. So yeah. what was some of that like? I'm always interested in, in like your unlearning moment, right? When, when you were looking at this notion of data, I remember the good old day, like this golden data source. All these notions I hear people constantly talk about, how much data, oh, we've, we've terabytes of data. It's I remember working with a bank and they got excited because they could tell me that the amount of data they were processing was taking down Google Cloud, that they were running more data than Google. And it all sounds grand and bravado, but it really doesn't mean a whole lot. So can you maybe share a little bit about sort of some of those transitions you've had on your perspective on how data is really evolving? Because I think a lot of 
the listeners hear the words, but they don't understand the meaning or they're anchoring language in sort of dated ideas now because the technology has moved forward. So could you share a little bit about your sort of own little unlearning journey in the data world? Sure. Yeah. And it it is interesting. You made a point that usually this maybe a graduate or someone who's new to a field comes in and they point to the things that are wrong or they come with the new ideas. And I wasn't young or a graduate, but I actually came a bit left field to the world of big data. And that's why I wasn't so committed to those assumptions. So I could challenge it. And then I was lucky to be in ThoughtWorks and surrounded by a lot of smart people and open-minded, relatively open-minded people to allow me to challenge those assumptions and work towards a different paradigm. But I think what I learned was, I guess I suppose I had to first learn what was this whole big data analytics about. I had done a ton of data work as part of like software development, technology development, data is always present. But for some reason, business and analytics, business intelligence and analytics had been siloed to a very different set of technologies, a different group. You know, you don't actually cross paths or in a different building altogether. So unfortunately, there wasn't much, a lot of cross-pollination of disciplines that we just talked about. It was absent. So I had to learn that. And what I learned was, first, I had to learn what was this evolution of big data analytics, how we had arrived to the systems and models that we had arrived today, which was really based on these assumptions, a few first level, like I deduced it to this like very basic assumptions that data for it to be valuable, it has to be centralized, integrated, centralized. And the moment you make that assumptions, then the technology around it becomes quite monolithic, the warehouse, the lake then the people around it become quite siloed and hyper-focused on a particular technology and disciplined away from the domains, the business domains where the action actually happens. So the, the world of big data was around integration of the data. The more of it is better accumulated under a centralized monolithic architecture. And then if you really then get stuck and you need to scale it somehow by breaking it into parts, then the way we had broken it into parts was around technology or technically partitioning it. So partition pipelines versus the lake versus the downstream marts. Like these are all very task-oriented technical partitioning rather than outcome-oriented domain partitioning. So then the unlearning is around how can we imagine this world very differently? And the moment you need to imagine something different, you need to use a very different language. So the way with data mesh, I started kind of imagining it wasn't anything novel, to be honest. It was a continuation of the journey of organizations towards a modern digital business anyway. This is something that has happened, and you're very familiar with that, that you know, organizations have started saying, okay, the way if I need to be nimble, if I need to move fast, if I need to scale, based on what access do I need to break out my organization? And one of those access that have been relatively successful is being the access of domains, right? The business functions and the outcomes that are you know, dedicated to a part of organization. And, and in my examples, I use a very simple example because we all relate to it, the digital streaming. So if you're a Spotify or Apple Music or you know, one of those organizations, one way to localize change to be able to scale out is to look at the capabilities of your business, like podcasts, like what we're doing here, podcast recording and releasing and supporting the creators. The other might, might be you know, your subscribers that are listening to digital music and artists and payment of those artists. So these are the functions of business that relatively change, relatively speaking, right? There's always change that crosses those boundaries, but change can be localized. And once you localize the change to an area, then you and define the interfaces between those areas, then you can scale up. So I just adapted that idea to the world of data. But the moment you do that, the moment you adapt, you know, this idea of decentralization of the data ownership back to the domains where they, the data belongs to, they, they understand the data and they need to share that data. And there has to be incentives around sharing of it. Then you faced with a ton of new challenges, right? How do I keep this data consistent? How do I make it interoperable? How do I reduce the cost of operating this data? And then the, the rest of the principles around 
data mesh came around. But I think the most important aspect, if I want to reduce all of that to the things we need to from now on focus on is the new way of imagining and the data and the new way of thinking. And I can talk to a couple of those points. Maybe they're a little bit controversial, but you know, for decades, we've used the language of asset. Data is an asset, right? It's actually in total. It's golden. It's the most important asset in your business. Well, maybe <laughs> after people. People are an asset, but yeah, no, yes. I love it. Yeah. Right. So if I actually, I went back to the early publications of TOGAF, which is a guideline for enterprise architects as what sort of guidelines they need to apply to model their enterprises. And it's been used quite a lot. And they had in a data section, they have data as an asset. And the next statement after that, data must be shared. And imagine the kind of the contradiction of the two statements. But if, because the moment you imagine something is an asset, what do you do with it? You want more? Well, of I, it. I want more. I, I want more. to keep it and I want to grow want it, to and make it, it bigger and, and be mine <laughs> and nobody else can have it. And I have the best one. Right. So it's the opposite effect, right? So maybe they should have said, and I thought, okay, we, I'm being actually very careful with the language. And so I have to catch myself even in the language. So I thought, okay, if we shift the perspective and said, data is a product. And I'm sorry that I know that product also has a monetary kind of thing associated with it, that you sell it and you transact it. And I personally don't like that aspect of it. But maybe it's an improvement to an asset because the moment you think about my data is a product, it's all about, and you know this much better than I do, Barry, in being in the product space, is that it's about delighting the experience of the consumers. You shift your perspective from me collecting this asset to me serving the user of this product, right? So I think we've got to start changing our language to change the way we think. That as a result, the change we design the systems and design our organizations. And this is what, just one example. I think of actually um, writing a book on data mesh. And for each of these principles that underpin data mesh, I have a section that says, like transition to data as a product. And I put like four or five, this from you know, data as an asset to data as a product, this from and to state to contradict just the way we imagine, imagine data just for fun to be a bit provocative. You know, immediately, like when you wrote this paper in whatever, 2019, you know, and I was reading through it, you know, so much resonated with me. Even the narrative as you're describing, like our idea around data, right? create this sort of single golden source of data, this one place and grow it and make it as big as possible. Like that's how companies started, right? It was like, be number one in your market, Jack Welch, you be, grow as big as you can, scale with as many people as you can, become this monstrosity, build a moat around your business, you know? And and then people started to realize as companies got bigger and bigger, it was just impossible for them to move. And so surprise, surprise, then the next iteration is we break into functions, right? So we'll, when we're building things, we'll have this analysis phase, we'll have this development phase, we'll have this testing phase. We'll, and these sort of like massive departments sort of spin up, right? And But still the whole idea, you know, it's end to end what you're trying to create, right? Like you need these sort of people, the idea takes ages because it breaks at some part of the process. And, and I think then I always remember interestingly, like, you know, when Steve Yegi wrote his famous platform rant, because the database was the limiting factor in Amazon scaling, and they realized is they needed to create these smaller, more autonomous units that had the capabilities to build things just like product teams. Like this is where this, this notion started to emerge from changing the organizational design to change the architecture redesign of the company, both technically and, and just how teams would work together. And so I think that's also when product thinking, as you're also mentioning, really, I think, started to explode because teams could own outcomes. They could be, to your Unix point again, super specialized. This is your skill. You're going to support the podcasters. Your job is to make sure the subscription is fantastic and people could own the outcomes. They could try things. They could see what worked, what didn't see the changes in behavior from their customers of the products that they were building, you know? And so when I was reading through your article and obviously I was delighted you, 
linked to hypothesis driven development, which, you know, uh, was a, no, an article that we published in 2013, which again was inspired because continuous delivery had been a thing from 2010. And we started to realize that you could make these small, frequent changes and rapidly and then experiment and test with customers. So having big projects didn't make sense anymore. You wanted smaller teams that could move faster. And so it's really fascinating to me then to just see this propagate, not only from an organizational design point of view, like how you set up your teams, your business, your, the outcomes you want to pursue and the teams to go after them, but also how that's not only showing up in the software architecture, but the data architecture now as well. And again, for me, I'm just like sitting there like fascinated to see this pattern, right? Because I, I just love the patterns. And so help people sort of understand then like a, a little bit about what are some of the, the steps you have to go through to sort of get here? What are What are some of the changes that are different that companies need to think about that they they have to do differently to get there? Or what's prompted the situation that all these notions of like vanity metrics of how much data you have or having a single source of data or or trying how many projects have I heard of people trying to create this single source of data? And people are still pursuing that, right? Paying millions of dollars. To try, and God, I, I can think of like many projects I've been on trying to like close these things down to create, again, these more smaller, you know, encapsulated where teams own the product vision, the technology and the data so they can understand what they're doing. So please share some more of your insights yeah. in that space. Sure. And, and as you said, I mean, data mesh was a hypothesis at first, right? We had bits and pieces of it developed, but it wasn't come together as one set of principles. You know, it wasn't reduced to this four set of principles. And the hypothesis was based on the observation that we had globally with large, complex organizations that they had the problem of scale. So, you know, there weren't one small organization with one single function. They had multiple functions, many domains, dynamic topology, like things changing all the time. Yeah. And they needed to kind of use data at scale at the scale here being the scale of like the, the ambition of the number of use cases that they want to use data for, the number of experiments that they actually needed to use data for, whether they are a retail company or technology provider builder, manufacturing company, the healthcare company, these are, there is no limit to the aspirations of how people want to use data. And you can just look at the mission statements of existing companies. Like for fun, I just go and read some of this to see how ambitious we are, but yet we're stuck in that bootstrapping, still in that bootstrapping phase of, I need the data. Where is the data that I can actually use? And it's just the processes of, you know, test and learn, kind of cycle of test and learn and measure and kind of refine your ideas is so hard when it comes to data-driven experiments where you say, okay, I want to actually experiment with the segmentation of my customers so that I can for this particular segment of my customers, I can offer them something different to see what, you know, what, what feedback do I get? And that's just so hard to do. So everybody was stuck in, how do I scale collecting data? How do I scale getting use out of my data? And as you said, everybody was stuck in those basic assumptions that technology providers really didn't help because they just reinforced those assumptions by providing technologies that are monolithic and big proprietary, full stack integrated, you know, things that we've moved long enough, far enough in the operational world. So the hypothesis came around by saying, okay, why don't we, instead of this ever moving goalpost of having all of this data in one place and collecting it, putting it in one place and try to kind of, you know, put a straight jacket around it so it doesn't change, embrace the dynamic nature of the data, the dynamic nature of the domains and say that create an architecture and an ownership of data that starts with the assumption that data can be useful and shareable and trustworthy right at the point of origin, and then allow for different domains and different aggregations, different projections to get created as a mesh picture, as a picture of the graph, right? So I have, let's say the podcast team producing this analytical data, all of the podcasts that are being released, the podcast listeners, over time and providing that data as then as a product to the rest of the organization. And then 
when you say as a product, it's a simple word to say, but it, there is a ton to unpack. How do you make data as a product? And I often refer to this simple model of, I think Hagen, if I say his name correctly, is a well-known kind of figure in the product management, Marty Kagan, that yeah, he has this, yeah. yeah, that he has this circle of, you know, three circles that good products or successful products ha- are at the intersection of feasibility, usability, and value, right? They create value. They're valuable, they're feasible, they're usable. So if you just think about how can I create data as a successful product at the intersection of that, and if you just drill in into usability, there's just so much to unpack there. What does a usable data mean? What is trustworthy, accessibility, understandably? Like there's just so much to unpack there. So if you said every domain now is responsible for providing their data in that fashion, in that usable fashion, all great then how do we make that possible? How do we take the burden of and the cost of doing that from every domain? And that's where the principle of platform thinking comes to play is what is this new breed of platform that's enablers, that's technical enablers that we need to create for these teams, these now domain-oriented kind of teams to enable creating their data and serving their data as a product and be able to maintain that without going and hire a lot of data engineers that are just so hired, just so difficult to hire. So that's, that calls for a different breed of platform. And it's just so easy to think about if my data is now a bunch of distributed, composable sets of data owned by different teams, but need to comply with you know, a set of usability characteristics and ease of creation, remove friction from use, remove friction from creating this data. What are the now the platform capabilities I need to build? And that's just such a white space for me in my mind for innovation because our technology is so stuck to in the world of let me serve a bunch of like data engineers to do their work or people who are not programmers and so not so much in between. So that's the third principle around kind of the data mission. The last part is, all right, now that, that I've created this ecosystem in a way, ecosystem won't work without any interoperability. So I, now I need to enable some sort of a global interoperability, but strike a balance between, you know, the equilibrium between centralization of decisions or global standards I need to put in place. So I have interoperability between my data so I can actually join my, you know, podcast, correlate my podcast listeners to subscribers demographic or other information. So I need a set of standards that kind of enables that interoperability also need to a set of policies being co- encoded and in an automated fashion applied to this data product. So I'm not breaching privacy or, you know, I'm, I'm maintaining the security. So how can we computationally embed that into the platform? And that's the idea of kind of a federated model of governance. It's the last piece of it. So it's really the idea that the first principles that are, as a group we arrived at were based on the observation of what wasn't working and also what was working in the adjacent domains. And let's apply that to the world of big data. And it, we came down with you know, four principles, domain ownership of the data, data as a product, self-serve data platform to enable an autonomous teams and a federated computational governance to balance the interoperability of a decentralized world with the trust you know, and security built in. You know, one of the hard things I think for people to understand is that there's a lot of like very deep and profound thinking, even in each one of these sort of four different domains that you're talking about, right? And one of the questions you always get is like, when these innovations happen, is it sort of just this one magic component that changes? But, you know, for me, I, you know, obviously, yeah, you're already shaking your head. You know, <laughs> so much of this stuff is about convergence of, of different ideas that change the way things can be done. So, you know, the ability or the amount of information that we can gather, the more mindset and mentality of thinking about your data as a product that you would serve to other customers. And again, that transition from where people are thinking of business intelligence as this like department that sits somewhere that nobody, and you just have to keep asking them for reports, like, Hey, can you know? Can you tell me on Wednesdays? Do hip hop listeners prefer to listen to uh, '80s hip hop or '90s hip hop? Oh, sure, yeah, we can find out in six weeks when we get through the rest of the, the requests that we've got, if we can even get the data at all, right? These are like, yeah. I think, 
the situations that most people are experiencing, where what I think you're describing here is that, you know, as these teams are created, they have responsibilities, right? Not only to their customers in terms of the, if I'm going to be responsible for creating this, the subscription part of the Spotify or Apple service, right? I've got to create a great billing aspects. I've got to understand what cards and ways people are paying. You know, I've got to create great services to those customers. But then internally in the company, I've got to think about the services I'm going to provide sort of back to internally into the company. So, you know, when someone's working on a different service or product, when they want to ask questions of me, that that information is easily accessible to them, right? And the notion that most people aren't really thinking about both external customers, the classic users of your product, and then this sort of internal customer now of the information you're learning about your product and being able to push that to other parts of the company, right? For you to be responsible for that data, to look after it, to make sure it's trustworthy, that it's safe, that you're not exposing things that you don't want to expose, right? Especially in a payments, like there's information that you can't make available. You're probably the best team that knows about that rather than relying on this external entity or group that, you know, they, they can't know everything. So there's so much here for me that is extremely exciting. And in many ways, I say this stuff and I'm like, isn't this obvious? But then I realize it's not <laughs> obvious. And so, you know, like even these transitions of thinking about internal and external customers, about owning and operating all the data your team needs, but also making that available for other teams to leverage. It feels like a lot of work though as well, right? And you mentioned people, everyone's, I still remember working with one of um, the financial services banks I work with where they were starting to explore this idea. And straight away, everyone's like, oh, every team needs a data scientist. Well, you know, that's impossible for us to hire these people. It's going to cost us a fortune. We've got 400 teams. We're never going to find 400 data scientists. You know, never mind all the work of thinking about building products for your external customers and internal. People just seem to get overwhelmed. So can you just share a little bit actually about how to get started here? Because again, I think it's another thing to be sort of debunked and unlearned that you have to have all these PhD level uh, data analytics. And just like you have to have the 10 terabytes of data before you can have any statistical significance to draw any conclusion, like all this sort of hyperbole. Can you just share a little bit and sort of debunk a lot of this stuff that it's actually pretty easy to get started quite small and taking the steps is actually part of the process of building capability. So can you talk yeah. about some of these things too as well? Yeah, I don't, I'm going to steal a line from ThoughtWorks. Uh, we both work, I mean, I currently work and you previously worked at ThoughtWorks. And one of the I think slides that appear in quite a lot of our customer facing decks is think big, start small, move fast. And I'm going to steal that line and just adapt it to this scenario again. Even though we need to think big, as in have ambitions around that decentralized kind of distributed ecosystem of data owners and interoperable, the same way that the you know, API revolution happened. I mean, the idea of serving your internal customers or developers, your fellow developers, as a customer and building platforms that satisfies their experience in their everyday journey of building software, that has been well adopted, maybe not well implemented in all the clients, but we see an immense like progress in that. Just looking at our, I don't know, I know I'm going down a rabbit hole for a little bit, but looking at, you know, software's technology radar, we've got a few kind of big, you know, areas focusing on that API as a product, platforms applying product management to platform building and, and so on. So I think that paradigm has been applied and has been embraced, but unfortunately, again, in a disconnected part of the organization, in the building services world, not building the data world. So though we need to start thinking big and have that vision to get there, and that vision is not just organization needs to have that vision, you need to have the top-down support. You need to have a supporting CEO, honestly, from the top to, to support this vision. But then the question is, okay, what are the smaller steps that I can get to get there. And to me, it's an evolutionary path. You can start, and this is exactly how we start big. You know, we've been at really large data mesh implementations going for multiple years now. 
But this is how we got started. And the way we got started was often have this big vision that this is the architectural vision, this is the organizational vision, and this is the yeah. culture vision we want to get it to. But where can we start? And where can we start is always slightly different for organizations because they are in a different point in their journey. Sometimes we come across organizations that have gone just gone through a big investment in a big, yet another big data platform. So they're exhausted from trying something new that didn't work. So if you come and say, scrap all of that and then start with this mesh. They just don't have the emotional, cognitive, financial yeah, bandwidth no, to do it. So, so you, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you have yeah. to like meet them where they are. But one way that regardless of where you are, you can, you can apply this paradigm or approach is that start with tangible use cases. Start with one, two, three complementary use cases that don't, you don't end up building a point solution. You still build, start building a foundation for more use cases. But find those use cases, you know, you might just say in the case of like that's now I'm just giving examples, but in the case of the digital streaming, say we want to provide a new set of business capabilities around emerging artists. We want to discover emerging artists and we want to give them support and bubble them up on their platform and give them support. So then you go, okay, that's a wonderful business case. For supporting emerging artists, let's work backward and see what data do we need? Do we think we need to start recognizing who are the emerging artists? And you would say, well, we need some social data. We need to see Facebook and other social platforms where these names are being bubbled. We need to look at our own listenership behavior. We need to look at our own artist profile. So then you identify these teams or these domains where the data needs to be provided as a, as a product, right? So then you start forming or empowering those teams to start surfacing those data products, not the whole universe, just the ones you need for that use case, right? But as part of doing that, you have to kind of say, okay, to just satisfy this emerging artist, let's say machine learning models or classification models or whatever we need to build. And also for these particular data domains to expose their data as a product, what are the platform capabilities we need to build? The first generation platform capabilities. It may not be perfect. It may not be satisfactory to a generalist programmer. It may need a, still, a little bit of a specialist to work with it, but it would be the first generation of our platform. And then put your platform team in place and start building the, the platform components. And then rinse and repeat, move to the next use case, move to the new use cases, and then you kind of start maturing. But have a vision as where you want to get to. So even though you're taking these small steps and moving fast, you're still moving towards that big vision that you had for building platform. Like recognize that that platform is not something that you build and, and use forever. It's, it's a product in itself and it will evolve and it will satisfy a new set of personas of developers. But I think ideally, as you said, these hyper-specialized silos that we've created, like the data scientist, data engineer, like data engineer is the one that I'm having a bit of a chat problem with, are we need to meet somewhere in between. And by that, I mean, we need to, of course, add a few skill sets to our generalist developers to understand that domain a little bit better. But at the same time, we need to raise the level of abstraction and reduce the complexity by hiding a lot of technical complexity that exists in the platforms today for those generalist developers to be able to produce the data products and for the data consumers that they which you know there's a large spectrum of data consumers for consumers from a hardcore data analyst to build a model you don't need many of those people to a data enthusiast and data analyst or anybody can you know analyze and play around with the data so then you need to support, again, raise the level of abstraction to support your platform as a product for that spectrum. So I think the two areas that there is just so much space for innovation and magic to be created at the intersection is the product thinking and bringing kind of product development minds to our technical capabilities and platforms and data. And the other one is really organizational change that we have already started, as you gave an example, how organizations went from monolithic to functionally divided to now maybe domain divided. And, and maybe there's another paradigm we haven't just looked into yet. Then continue that to bring that to the siloed world of data. I'm just so excited when we're talking about this, because for me, again, I, I keep seeing this problem 
right? Even with products, it's great to hear you talk about the way to start tackling this is identify an outcome that you're aiming for, right? Like, let's try and create an offering for emerging artists. And then, you know, often what you start asking this question, well, what information do we need to find out? Rather than what information do we have, it's what do we need to find out? And how can we start gathering this information to inform the product that we might build? This is sort of really fascinating to me, right? Like I just released a paper on precision product creation, which is this notion of organizations flipping their thinking as well. Companies keep having this notion of, I have to come up with ideas and those ideas are going to turn into products. And then I'm going to have this great product suite and then I'm going to push those products into the market. And that's going to that's going to create me this great business. But, you know, what I think counterintuitively now is that is not about developing products. It's about developing understanding of the product and then creating it. It's actually sort of in reverse. And this sort of what got us to this notion of even rather than thinking about product portfolios to start thinking about information portfolios. Like what's the information you need to start learning or understanding about people how they interact in these domains in order to build the services or the features or the functions that they want to be successful, which is, again, it's sort of this total flip where most people are like, I have an idea. I get a team together. I tell the team what, what idea to execute. They build this product. They put it into the market. And then they start finding out how people use it. And if we're lucky, we have enough money and time and budget to keep like going through this long cycle and maybe we'll build this great product. It's sort of like this process batching problem you were describing <laughs> rather than flipping it and thinking, what outcome am I aiming for? What, what would be something amazing to be in the world? Maybe it might be um, emerging artists, maybe. What information would I need to start learning or gathering to understand about that? And Straight away, you were starting to give examples like plugging into social media or looking for conversations that are happening on social channels or what's missing. And there's been so many great products that have been built this way. Like one good example is Lipton, right? Lipton, we're we're trying to like figure out new types of products to enter into their product suite. And it wasn't the product managers that came up with something. Basically, you know, the data team started like plugging in sources like Twitter feeds or the customer complaints information and just synthesizing it a little bit. And what they noticed is that they were getting tons of requests for like, do you have any vegan products? Is this product vegan sensitive? And they looked at their portfolio and said, we don't have any vegan products. Wow, we should build some vegan things, right? And then like they launched this vegan ice cream and it goes absolutely crazy. And it wasn't the obvious place to look. They pulled information from customer complaints and and records and questions that they were getting and cross-referenced that with social media conversations that were happening to sort of get this sort of intent about what people were, what was missing, what they were looking for. We were one of the lucky teams, I think, that they were able to do that, right? Because because a lot of ideas and a lot of those questions, right? The first curious questions that what can we discover get killed because it takes months and bureaucratic, you know, governance process and broken out of the data swamps to get to the data. So we, that's why I think we're still in that bootstrapping phase of getting access to the data. And we've done that, we've done that for half a century and we still haven't solved it. So that's why I think we need to, Think about like this is wonderful example that you gave. So if you just overlay like some of the data mesh concepts onto that example and say, okay, the customer center or the call center or whatever customer service has a set of data that they are generating by doing their business, answering customers' questions, that data should be served as a product available, self-serve to the rest of the organization. The team that wants to now join data from the call center and from these other domains, like the products that we have, the portfolio of maybe the products, the product categories, whatever that domain is, they should have all the tools to very quickly discover, like discover what's out there, 
very quickly to understand that data and very quickly to be able to merge and combine and build a new data set and start exploring it. So if you just unpack this very simple example and overlay some of the data mesh concepts, it becomes apparent that what's stopping us today to just do what you just described in every small or big organization. And, you know, also, I think it's why when you talk to people about these ideas, it's very hard for them to grasp it because their reality, and I I can speak more from this from the product development point of view. I've been talking to these people about this idea of shifting away from, we sort of went through these various different transitions, even in like product development, right? There was sort of like this sort of classic world where to manage uncertainty, you had a plan. You needed the plan and it's hierarchical and top down, lots of functional sort of, you know, units and metrics are like revenue and ROI and all this type of stuff. When the notion of maybe lean enterprise and experimenting and all this, this experimenting to manage uncertainty or thinking more like autonomous teams, small cross-functional teams, innovation accounting, like the stuff that sort of was about creating these sort of small little domains of people and just give them a responsibility. I think most companies are trying to get there, but they're struggling. But then like to really, really like ratchet it up, I think to this next level where we have this abundance of information and this huge ability to compute and synthesize with machine learning and at a fraction of the cost, people can really start simulating punches and pulling disparate information together and looking for you know, these odd gaps, like finding, hang on, all these people are asking for vegan products over here. Uh, What's our product, current product suite portfolio? There's a gap here. We can fill this gap. And we, all we've really had to do is just like, you know, model a few things, talk about what's potential, and now we can go and execute on this. And it's such a different world. And when I talk to people about this, they just say to me, Oh, well, you know, Barry, um, that's not possible. Um, you know, well, we need to be data informed or data driven or, oh, we used to collect hun- millions of terabytes of data and we couldn't draw any conclusions from it. And for me, I'm just like, this is, it's sort of meh comments, right? Like, it, what does any of those statements even mean? So what are some of the other things you're seeing, like to help people understand? Because I feel like, Some of this is explaining a world that most people have never experienced, right? Where where they could actually just say, I have a hunch. I just have to ask customer service, plug into their API, type in a few queries. I get these great responses. And then suddenly I'm like, okay, there's a gap here. As a creative problem solver, I've identified a gap and now I'm going to go build something to solve it. Like, it just seems like probably a world away for people who are like, waiting six weeks just to get a copy of some database so they can write an Excel script and spend months drilling through. And hopefully, maybe we might find a good idea. We're certainly not even starting with asking a question. Never, yeah. you know, we're, We've been told to build something and we better find out what any information we have about it. Again, it's the wrong way to go. Yeah. And I think Again, that I see this, uh, there's a sad part of looking at it as, oh, there's, you know, there's so much missed opportunity. What are we doing with, I keep track of this report that comes uh, from New Vantage Partners, a consultancy company that they do survey from 1,000, Fortune 1,000 companies and, and their CTOs and CDOs and CDAOs and all these new titles that never existed before, you know, a decade ago. And it's sad to see how much we're spending, like the pace of investment is increasing as well as the total number of the dollar amount we're investing and yet so little value. And then and then I go to the companies and see this lack of empathy for folks on the other side, whether you are building the data platform and you have lack of empathy for people who need to use it and you are, you know, building something that is still at, you know, spending all that money, but it's not usable for someone that just want to, as you said, just want to go explore to see what they find. They may find something, they may not find anything, right? But you at least had the ability to go and explore. So on one hand, you are spending a lot of money on the platforms that they're not really satisfying the persona of the users. I was yeah. on a call that the you know people who are building the platform say, well, these business people need to go fire all these data analysts that they have and hire a bunch of data 
engineers because now we shall use this new set of technologies and they don't understand. And, and really, that's not reality. Like you've got to build, you've got to meet them halfway. They need to be able to upskill and cross skill. And the, the level of abstraction you provide should meet where your company is today and then allow them to grow from there. So I think we come back to that lack of empathy and product thinking and experimentation. I'm just like a silly example. About eight, 10 years ago, I, was, I wasn't a data scientist, but I used out of the box data science APIs from Google at the time and downloaded you know, a data catalog of uh, music to just test with like, what is my taste of music? And I did this for fun to do a presentation and get the machine compete with the man and had people in the room listening to my to the music that was being played and they were trained that I said like, I like this music, I don't. And then I had trained the machine, the algorithm before then. And it was, I wasn't data scientist, I was an engineer. I knew how to code, how to write APIs or ask for, you know, calling the prediction APIs or classification APIs or do data visualization, like very simple things like that can empower experimentation. And little I knew that I actually had an affinity for female singers. I did a simple data visualization of the bubbles of different categories and attributes of the data that was available. And the, the fun part was the data was available to me, that this catalog of curated and data as a product of this sample music for large sample music was available to me. So then after kind of rating it, what, what I like, or what I don't like, I realized, wow, I like you know, music with these characteristics and I like female singers for some reason more than male singers, at least in that sample. So a lot of things bubbled up that I didn't even knew about myself. And I only use very simple tools to do that. So I think this culture of experimentation and culture of innovation, and let's remove the friction out of the way so people can experiment and can innovate. And, And that removing the friction comes to make data available. And let's be honest, we've tried to make data available as a centralized thing by somebody else down the stream. Hasn't worked. Let's go back to the source. Let's empower the people that are closest to the data. Let's imagine the platforms that really makes the experimentation easy rather than require more specialization and yet another fraction of engineers to be ML engineers to be created or whatever other engineers. Let's let's rethink that because we've got to raise the bar and we've got to meet people where they are so they can apply what the skills that they have with a little bit of, of course, learning new things. We continuously learn in this space but meet people where they are to empower them to experiment. Yeah. And I, I think it's really for people to take away is that there's so many great tools out there that you can just start using that can provide some of these novel insights, either about yourself or a problem domain that you're trying to explore. Like you don't have to be a data scientist. You, a lot of the complexity is starting to be abstracted away from people. So, you know, if someone like me, who's a, thankfully re- long retired engineer and has stopped my gift was to stop writing code for the industry and, and adding more bugs so ho- hopefully other people are doing that now but you can start learning and understanding this stuff by using it like that's the only way right and you can't hire your way out of these problems you have to sure you need to bring expertise in but you also need to build the internal capabilities and it's not just again just a data everyone i think needs to start learning this. And, you know, if I, if I was thinking even from a product leader point of view, you have to start understanding consumer science. You have to start understanding how and what is available in this data world that we exist in. Otherwise, you're just falling so far behind between the companies who that obviously we're both helping identify these opportunities go after and they're building better, stronger, portfolios of products it's not just a case of one product and i think that's super but i think exciting. we need to we need to go back to the board we need to really ditch some of those old assumptions there's a lot of work for all of us to do here for people like yourself who work with mm. you know organizational structure and culture as well as product development as well as technologists people who are building platform i mean this is really data mesh for me like from my vision is is an invitation for people to come together and apply these principles. That's why I've been staying away from preaching what are the exact practices or tools, because those will change and those will evolve. But hopefully if we can agree on these simple four principles, 
It's really an invitation to create the next generation set of tools, to create the organization design around it and the roles and team structure and rethinking data as something more alive rather than this dead fit body of thing that you put in some centralized place. Hopefully somebody would come and use it. Yeah, it's really an invitation. Well, I am very, very excited to both follow your work in this space as we continue to figure it out. I'm looking forward to hopefully working again with you more and more in this area in the future. And, you know, for anybody who's listening, I just highly recommend go look up all your great, fantastic posts on it. I know we'll write some posts on this stuff together in the coming weeks and share more. But thank you so much, Mac, for being on the show. It's been a pleasure to hang out and spend time with you as ever. Thanks, Barry, for hosting me. And I'm looking forward to our collaboration. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Unlearn podcast. Help us get the word out and make this